And hello, this is uh, A.W. Anthony Mays, Senior Pastor of the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church, uh, bringing greetings to you and welcoming you to our Bible study session where we seek to become better students, understand more, have more of God's Word as believers. And certainly if you are a seeker, if you are not a believer but you are interested in the subject of our faith, this Bible study may well be an avenue for you to discover God and to discover God's will that's in his word, learning more about God. This is Bible study, and we want to uh, give to you our Bible study strategy, and which is simply this, that when you are coming to God's word, we urge that you come prayerfully. Simple prayer, but a sincere prayer. Lord, open my eyes. Lord, give me understanding. Lord, make me to know your truth, what you would have for me. And then begin Bible study with the simple first step of reading the word. Reading the word carefully, deliberately. This is essential. This is the foundation of wherever you will go in the Word is first the reading of the Word. Do not be careless in your reading, but make sure that you're respecting the way it is written. King James Version is our standard version, a choice. It's so much in our lives from our youth up and much that is in my heart that is of the Word of God is in the King James Version, but that does not mean that I do not read, study, or consult other Bible translations. I would say to us again, every English Bible that we have is a translation. Simply put, Jesus did not speak English when he was on the earth. The prophets and the writers of Scripture did not write in English. They wrote in either Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek. And for us to have English Bibles, it was necessary for those who trained in it who were educated toward that extent to translate or to bring over from those original languages to our English language. And that's what the King James Version is from the year 1611. The King of England named James authorized scholars to produce an English Bible. And it has become very popular in fact, probably yet, it is the most popular version of the Bible since the year 1611. But there are other Bible translations that sometimes can be very helpful to understanding passages of Scripture and to understand uh, terms that uh, have been used in the translation. Sometimes even in my personal study, I may place two translations in parallel columns and have a clear picture of the choice of English words and the arrangement of English words uh, to help me to have sometimes a clearer understanding. So all I'm talking about is the first step, and that is reading. Be careful in your reading, and then read it again, and then read it again. You cannot read it too many times. Be careful, though, when you're reading. The second step is really the most essential step after reading, and that is interpreting. Seeking to discover the meaning of what you've read. What you read gives you information. Today's language, it gives you data. You have observations 
when you read the text, but then you must analyze, you must seek to interpret, to discover the meaning of what you've read. Sometimes the Bible interprets itself. Sometimes you can continue reading and the Bible will very plainly share the meaning of passages, of stories, of words, but then sometimes it is very helpful to have Bible study material, to have an opportunity to see what scholars have said, what comments they have made, that you can see if those comments can help you to understand something that was not quite so clear. And so I say again that if you are new to Bible study, that if you want a first encouragement to invest in a Bible resource, I encourage you to purchase a study Bible. You can do this in hardback, such as the one that I use for this Bible study presentation, or you can now do it electronically. Computer resources make so many Bible resources very convenient and at hand. Smartphones and devices of tablets also take advantage of putting Bible resource material, study materials at your hand. And if you're serious about knowing God's Word, sometimes the investment will help you to have clearer understanding of passages. Bible, study Bibles may have outlines, may have footnotes, may have pictures, may have articles, diagrams, cross-references, dictionary, atlas, much material that's helpful can be in one volume. And so I say to you, this could well be your first investment. And the third step is then that step of being obedient to the Word of God. You read it for what it says, you study it for what it means, and then you begin to live accordingly, to walk in the Word of God. And so this is what we encourage you each time when we gather for Bible study and we want you to join with us now as we go to the Lord in prayer to bless this time together in his word. Pray with us. Join your spirit with our spirit. Heavenly Father, our God, bless your word in our hearts. Give to us understanding. Cause spiritual light to shine upon us that we might see what you'd have before us. Let it not just be the knowledge of history, but let it be transforming, growing us, nurturing us in your word. Bless those in our unseen audience to be blessed in this way, according to the promise of your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're walking through the book called Second Samuel. We're walking through the book called Second Samuel. And this evening, we're going to chapter 14. Chapter 14 of Second Samuel. As we've been saying through uh, the books of First Samuel and Second Samuel, looking at the history of of Israel, of God's people. We've gone from having no king to having the first king, man named Saul, succeeded by a boy who grew up to manhood named David, who has become king, and now David is king. But we learn in this second Samuel David committed a great act of sin against God, plotting the murder of a woman's husband after having uh, an adulterous relationship with her, taking advantage of her. Uh, she becomes pregnant, and to cover it up 
uh, he finally resorts to having the husband eliminated. He's judged for that because God sends a prophet to make him to know that it was no secret with God what he had done. And one of the judgments against David was that the household of David, the family of David, that he would not know any peace. There's going to be trouble uh, in the home and in the family of David. And we've recently come into the experience of that trouble leading up to chapter 14. David had several wives and had children by these various wives. And as a result, there's a son named Absalom who has a beautiful sister named Tamar but he has a half-brother named Amnon who thinks he really loves Tamar, plots with his friend how it was that he could have her, and he shames her. He literally uh, takes advantage of her and then shames her by casting her away. Absalom waits, excuse me, yes, Absalom waits bides his time, and then after two years, plots that he might kill this brother named Amnon, which he does, but then after killing this half-brother, he flees away from Jerusalem, the palace, the nation, and he remains there uh, in exile, away from Jerusalem and Israel for a two-year period. He's actually gone to a place called Gesher, where if you learn Bible history, you find out he chose to go there, I'm sure, because his grandfather uh, was king of this nation, this little nation that was not too far away from Israel, but his mother, David's wife, his mother, one of them, uh, was daughter to this king of Gesher. And so that's where he chose to live uh, while he is in exile. Well, when we come to chapter 14, he said, Now Joab, the son of Zariah, uh, perceived that the king's heart was toward Absalom. That is, Joab knows the heart of David, and he knows David yearns for. Uh, he'd love to have Absalom back in fellowship, that they might be reconciled. Uh, and so Joab comes up with this very elaborate plan and scheme how to get the king uh, to bring Absalom back home. That's what he does. So at verse 2, Joab, who is David's general over his army, he sent to Tekoa and fetched thence a wise woman and said unto her, I pray thee, feign thyself to be a mourner and put on now mourning apparel and anoint not thyself with oil but be as a woman that had a long time mourned for the dead. He sends perhaps to the village, the town of Tekoa, I believe because uh, it is uh, far enough away that she would be a stranger uh, to David and he would not immediately recognize her. Perhaps that explains uh, why she is uh, chosen uh, from this village. Joab's plan, as he lays it out, is for her to assume a disguise, for her to play a role. And her role that he asked her to play is to be a woman in mourning, in long time mourning. So he tells her to... Um, put on clothes, or apparel, fitting for someone who is in mourning, and do not, in other words, don't anoint yourself with oil. In other words, don't make yourself up. 
but in every way make it appear that you are a woman who is grieving. Verse 3, Joab is instructing her, and he says, And come to the king and speak on this manner unto him. So Joab put the words in her mouth. He's giving her, you might call her a script. You might call the writing in, that he lays out. He's teaching her how to approach the king, and he's teaching her what words that he would have her to say exactly to the king. So at verse 4, here is the execution of this scheme. And when the woman of Tekoa spake to the king, she fell on her face to the ground and did obeisance and said, Help, O king. It was normal for the subjects of the kingdom when they had issues uh, that they would uh, come and plead their case to the king. Uh, the king had power and authority to address their issues, their matters, what wrongs they felt that they have experienced. So she comes to the king, she comes humbly, and she cries out for help. Help, O king. And verse 5, And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? That language simply means he's asking her, What's the matter? And she answered, I'm a deed, indeed a widow woman, and mine husband is dead. Well, that's really two ways of saying the same thing. If she's a widow, then it means her husband is dead. But not only does she identify herself as a woman who is a widow, but she says her husband is dead. So that kind of strikes at the heart of her circumstance to make her to appear the more pitiful before the king. She's playing this role that Joab has directed for her to play. Verse 6. And thy handmaid had two sons, and they too strolled together in the field, and there was none to part them, but the one smote the other and slew him. So in this story that uh, she's told to tell the king, she, as a widow, is told to tell to the king she once had two sons, but for some reason the sons fought each other. No one separated them. No one ended the fight. No one stepped in to intervene. And the fight resulted in one brother striking the other brother, causing his death. So two sons, but they fight. And in the fight, one of the sons is killed. Verse 7. The story goes further, and behold, the whole family is risen against thine handmaid. And they said, Deliver him that smote his brother, that we may kill him for the life of his brother whom he slew, and we will destroy the heir also. And so they shall quench my coal which is left and shall not leave to my husband neither name nor remainder upon the earth. In Israel, there is the principle of life for life. Life for life. And on that principle, because one brother caused the death of the other brother, now the family, the clan, the larger family members, the relations are demanding that they be allowed to take the remaining son and kill him for justice sake, that he must die because he has killed his brother. Well, the result of this, this woman in this story is saying that this would wipe out the future of her family. She's a widow. 
She's only had these two sons. She's only got one son remaining. And so she puts it in the language that this is like the only, only remaining coal, which would be a source of fire. Without that, there would be a coldness, a dryness. And she's saying that if this son is killed, then my husband's name would die because the Jews expected their, their lives would be extended through their children, down through the generations, that each succeeding generations would cause the names and the remembrances of the ancestors to continue alive. But if all of those who could bring forth new seed and new generations are slain, then that would be the end of this particular family. So at verse 8, the king, this is David, said to the woman, Go to thine house, and I will give charge concerning thee. He says, Go back home. Uh, he, he doesn't seem to know where she's from, but he says to her, he's giving her reassurance. The woman seeks further reassurance. Uh, it seemed that this is, that Joab has uh, really instructed her uh, what word she's to use and her persistence, because at verse 9, and the woman of Tekoa said unto the king, My lord, O king, the iniquity be on me and on my father's house, and the king and his throne be guiltless. She's offering that we'll take the responsibility for this because this is really not following the principle of a life for a life. A murderer must die for the life that he's taken, and she's willing to assume the guilt and that the king will be guiltless in this matter. Verse 10, the king gives her assurance. The king said, Whosoever saith aught unto thee, bring him to me, and he shall not touch thee any more. If you have any resistance from anybody, you make sure that person is brought to me, and that person will not bother you anymore. Verse 11, Then said she, I pray thee, let the king remember the Lord thy God, that thou wouldest not suffer the revengers of blood to destroy any more, lest they destroy my son. And he said, As the Lord liveth, there shall not one hair of thy son fall to the earth. Look at verse 11. The woman is really asking David to remember, to honor his word of protection for her only remaining son that David would remember the charge that he's making at this time unto her. And King David says, giving her absolute assurance, not one hair of thy son shall fall to the earth. In other words, no harm, no harm is going to come to your son. She's holding him to that. Now here is, here's a critical moment. Then the woman said, like, let Thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak one word unto my lord the king. And he said, say on. Well, in anticipation, this is the second time that uh, someone has told a story, has given a scene and setting as story form, but then they're going to make application of it. Remember Nathan? the prophet who came to David and his story had to do with the man who was rich, who was neighbor to a man who was poor and the poor man only had one little ewe lamb uh, that he loved and cherished, but the rich man had taken it and had served his guests, not going into his abundant herds to satisfy the hospitality. And uh, David in his righteousness uh, said that the man who had done such a thing would surely die. Well, he did not know that Nathan was going to say, well, you are that man, because this was related to the fact of what David had done with Bathsheba and what he had conspired to have done to Uriah. Well, in that strategy, Joab has set this woman up 
telling this story and getting the king to take her side to save her son. And she's now asking for permission to say a few words to the king. And verse 13, he's, he's, he's encouraged her. And so the woman is speaking in verse 13. Wherefore then hast thou thought such a thing against the people of God? For the king doth speak this thing as one which is faulty, in that the king doth not fetch home again his banished. All this is to say, you're telling me that a son could be spared even though that son was guilty of murder, guilty of striking his brother, and you have ruled that not one hair of that son would fall to the ground. And the woman is now pointing out, you are giving direction in that, but you are not following your own counsel because you have a son, Absalom, who in like manner has killed his brother, but you have not brought Absalom home. You have not brought the one that has been banished. Verse 14. For we must needs die and are as water spilt on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. Neither doth God respect any person, yet doth he devise means that his banished be not expelled from him. This woman in this telling is saying that we're all passing away. Our lives are one-way journeys. What she talks about, our lives are like water that's built on the ground that cannot be gathered up again. And she's teaching that God is a God of mercy. God is a God of restraint. And that She's really telling David, uh, you shouldn't give up on Absalom. So, verse 15. Now therefore that I am come to speak of this thing unto my Lord the King. It is because the people have made me afraid and thy handmaid said, I will now speak unto the king. It may be that the king will perform the request of his handmaid. She's going back to that story as Joab has put these words into her mouth. Verse 16, For the king will hear to deliver his handmaid out of the house of the man that would destroy me and my son together out of the inheritance of God. She's come because the king has power to grant this request. Verse 17, Then thine handmaid said, The word of my lord the king shall now be comfortable, for as an angel of God, so is my lord the king to discern good and bad. Therefore the lord thy God will be with thee. What an elaborate story to tell, to get the king to soften toward his son Absalom, who has lived away from, he's been banished uh, from the kingdom for these two years, these two long years. And so it is that this story proves very effective because now the king, in his discernment, begins to recognize who is behind this. Then the king answered and said unto the woman, Hide not from me, I pray thee, the thing that I shall ask thee. And the woman said, Let my lord the king now speak. I'm going to ask you something, and I want you to give me a straight answer. I want you to tell me of a truth without holding back. Verse 19. And the king said, Is not the hand of Joab with thee in all this? 
the king discerns that in what this woman has done with this story and this pressure she has put upon him to allow Absalom to return, he said, I see Joab in this. And so, verse 19, the woman answered and said, As thy soul liveth, my lord the king, none can turn to the right hand or to the left from aught that my lord the king has spoken. For thy servant Joab, he bade me, and he put all these words in the mouth of thine handmaid. She's confessing, she's owning up that this has been a strategy created by Joab for this purpose of moving the king toward mercy, toward the life of Absalom. Verse 20, to fetch about this form of speech hath thy servant Joab done this thing, and my Lord is wise according to the wisdom of an angel of God, to know all things that are in the earth. And the king, he speaks to Joab, and the king said unto Joab, Behold, now I have done this thing. Go therefore, bring the young man Absalom again. Success. Success in the strategy, in that the king relents and tells Joab, Go and bring Absalom, bring him back home. And verse 22, And Joab fell to the ground on his face and bowed himself and thanked the king. And Joab said, Today thy servant knoweth that I have found grace in thy sight, my lord, O king, in that the king hath fulfilled the request of his servant. We're going to stop there at verse 22, where this scheme, this plot, this strategy of Joab is successful, but they work at it in such a way to lead David to come to the point where he can receive Absalom back to Jerusalem according to the principle of of the mercy that God would have. Well, that's our time for today. But if you have questions or comments, certainly we'd love to hear from you. You can address us through email at pastorawmays at themount.net. We'd love to hear from you. Check out our church ministry website, www.themount.net. Much information about the announcements programs, ministries, activities going on at the Mount Sinai Church. We welcome you to share with us on the journey. And until next time together, go in God's peace.